Paul and Erica Simone are serving in Elkhart, Indiana with Sunset Solutions. They've been on the mission field since 2005. Sunset Solutions is a radio planting ministry that helps partners begin and maintain Christian radio stations around the world. Paul is a church liaison, building relationships with area churches on behalf of Sunset Solutions. Part of this role involves making local churches aware of opportunities for global impact. Erica is a partnership development coach helping new recruits and veteran missionaries in their ministry partnership development. Erica also helps in the area of communications. Paul and Erica have many ties to Western New York. Please check the missionary highlight in today's bulletin for a recent update from the Simones. Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys today? Awesome. Yeah. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Szymanski. I'm one of the deacons here. I'd like to welcome you to Obi Community Church, whether you're joining us here in person or online uh, through our streaming uh, platform. Oh, thanks, Brody. Brody's hiding. Oh, there he is. Paid no attention to the man behind the TV. Uh, just a quick update on the Simones. Um, they recently uh, did some traveling for their 30th wedding anniversary. Uh, I think they, they borrowed an RV or a camper from someone and kind of were, were driving around. And uh, they sort of ended up in the, their, their plan was to go to the southwest to still do a little bit of mission work while they're down there. And it, it's always interesting when you come upon a situation and you're like, oh, I guess we were supposed to do this. Um, there, in their travels, there was a gentleman who had run out of gas. And so they uh, stopped to help him. His name was Gilbert. Uh, he was from the, the Hopi Indian tribe. And they were able to share the gospel with him. You know, that's what missionaries are supposed to do. That's what we're all supposed to do. Like, sometimes you got to think, like, maybe this is happening for a reason. Yeah. Um, and he actually shared with them that he had been talking to his sister, cousin, sister cousin. No? Just his cousin. Okay, just his cousin. Uh, about some spiritual things, about some, uh, you know, the gospel and things like that. Uh, so they were, you know, they were like the follow-up uh, to the previous conversation. And, you know, I think a lot of times we, we put pressure on ourselves to be like, well, how can I lead somebody like, you know, down the Romans road and, you know, and this and that and from, you know, this horrible life of sin to, to praying the prayer with me? I think most times that's not how that works. I mean, I'm sure that it does, but we're a link in a chain sometimes. And you have to be aware of where you are and what your situation is. And you just might get a couple of seconds to say something or whatever. And you need to take that opportunity because who, who knows what's going to happen with Gilbert. We can pray for Gilbert now. I mean, now we can be that link in the chain of prayer support. Um, but yeah, so the Simones had that opportunity to, to really pour into somebody's life for just a brief period of time. And so just, just kind of be aware of those situations that you may come across, you know, in your everyday life. I mean, I'm sometimes like blind to them. And like you'll get in the car and you'll be like, dang it, why didn't I say this, this, and this? To that person when they asked me about that other thing you know that was that would have been a great opportunity so that's just some prompting sometimes like okay I need to be more aware of this so so yeah so the Simones there's their update uh, sounds like they had a, a great trip uh, relaxing but also still in that time able to share the gospel so uh, youth group tonight is at the normal time youth group tonight is at the normal time yes Jeff Oh, youth group is at the normal time. Yes, because I'm sure even for uh, teens, the key to learning is repetition, repetition, repetition. Yeah, so um, if you are joining us online, uh, you can fill out your digital connection card. If you're joining us here in the worship center, you can fill out a digital connection card, or you can use the one that's in the uh, seat uh, in front of you in the pew back. And um, I think that's about it for today. So, Oh, our small group is meeting tonight here at the church at 5. We're doing a study what? 
Oh, thank you. Uh, we're doing a study on Mark. Uh, we have also have some child care available. If you have uh, a little one and you're like, ah, I don't want to go to a small group because who's going to watch my kid? I'm just going to have to like keep track of them the whole time and be distracted. We actually have someone who can watch those kids for you. So yeah, we'll be here at five. Uh, my wife reminds me uh, that uh, we need to start collecting names and addresses. If you have someone who that you know is in the military, either uh, stateside or deployed, and you have an address for them and a name, if you could get those to Rita, uh, we'd like to send out a little uh, gift package uh, at Christmas time for them. So start to think about those things and get those names to read it. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we are able to come into your house uh, and just be here together in fellowship and worship. And especially today as we uh, have some baptisms, Lord, we are just so thankful for the decision that those uh, people have made uh, moving forward in their faith. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome everybody. So glad to see you here today. Today is going to be an awesome, awesome day. Really special. I'm looking forward to it. We're in this final part of the series that we've been calling Better Together uh, because as a church, we are better together. We're designed to be in relationship with each other. We're designed to be a community of followers of Jesus, and so we are better together. And today we are celebrating two things that are definitely, definitely better together. And I, I, we're not talking about peanut butter and jelly. That's, that's definitely better together. Uh, uh, milk and cookies, those are better together. Uh, bacon and eggs, or like I said earlier, bacon and anything is better together. Um, spaghetti and meatballs are better together, but we're talking about something better than that. It's even better than Batman and Robin, right? We're talking about baptisms and communion today. And so really looking forward to it. Yeah, we can clap for that. <clears throat> we can clap all day for that. <clears throat> And uh, I'm, I'm so excited uh, about this as we talk about baptisms and communion. You know, and, and I'll say this a few times uh, in the service today, and I've said it other times, but Jesus never told us to celebrate his birth, okay? Which we love the birth of Christ, right? Uh, we love to celebrate uh, Christmas, but Jesus never told us to celebrate his birth, but he gave us two things to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and that's baptism and communion. And so we're going to do both of those today. Looking forward to it. If you're watching online, I want to invite you to join us, uh, at least for the, the communion part. I mean, I don't know how you join us for baptism, unless you fill up your, ba your uh, bathtub. I, I guess you could do that. But, uh, you know, if you want to join us for communion, you might want to get some, some bread and juice around. Uh, that would be great. Um, there's, uh, there's little uh, communion packets in each one of your uh, pews, uh, if you can find those. If you have too many people in your row and you need to steal from somebody else, go ahead and do that, because we like to steal in church. Uh, so anyway, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I can't remember exactly which page it is in the Pew Bible, but hopefully you can find it. There's a table of contents in the front if you need to find where Acts chapter 2 is. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one home with you. We'd love for you to have God's Word in your house. So Acts chapter 2. And here, here's the thing. Throughout this series, we've really been focusing on this aspect of doing life together in this context of community. It's so crucial for the body of Christ to, to be united and, and to be together. We've said that life is better connected. We are designed for relationships. Life is better connected. And in fact, we've said that circles are better than rows. And I love the fact that we're sitting in rows right now. I love the fact that, that you, you came out here and you're going you're gonna to sit in rows and you're going to you know, listen to somebody speak. But I believe that circles are better than rows because we were designed for relationships with each other. And today we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, and we're going to see how the church got its start over 2,000 years ago. And some of the things I want us to discover, and I think this is so amazing as we look, about, uh, look at this, is we're going to discover that from day one, they celebrated baptisms together. From day one, they celebrated communion together from day one. From day one, they met together in the temple courts, kind of a large group gathering from day one. And from day one... They met as the church scattered in small groups from house to house. So all four of those things are things that we are still continuing to do here 2,000 years later. I think that's amazing. You see all that in this passage. So to kind of set the stage for Acts chapter 2, I want you to kind of think about the context, the background of what was going on in Acts chapter 2. This is not long after the resurrection of Jesus, and Jews had come from all over the world to celebrate uh, the festival called Pentecost. You know, they had just celebrated Passover, you know, a, a few weeks before that. But now a bunch of people have, have gathered around to celebrate 
Pentecost. Um, and and, and you got to kind of picture this. So Jews weren't all just living in Israel. They, they lived all over the place. But when they had these national festivals, people would kind of come back in, uh, you know, come back to Jerusalem for these festivals. So there's tons and tons of people in Jerusalem at this time uh, called Pentecost for this festival. And it was also at this time that the apostles and, and the other followers of Jesus at that time, and there was about 120 of them, Scripture tells us, that they had gathered together and they were praying for one another. They were encouraging one another. And while they're praying, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. For the first time, the Holy Spirit comes upon them and indwells them. And they begin speaking in languages that they had never learned before. It'd be like for me to, to go to France and all of a sudden I'm speaking French and I'd never done that before. So this miraculous event takes place and they're speaking in these languages. And so you have all of these Jews that aren't from Jerusalem and Israel, but, you know, so they, they, they come into Jerusalem, and now they're starting to hear all of these Galileans speaking in their native language, and they're like, how do they know our language? And so this draws a crowd, and everybody's just like, they're drawn into this miraculous event where, where these, the, the apostles and, and, the, and the other disciples, um, they're speaking in these, these languages, and this draws a huge crowd. So Peter does what any good preacher would do, hey, there's a huge crowd here. I should speak to them, you know? He, he speaks to them, and, and he tells them about what had happened to Jesus just a few weeks earlier. And he spoke to them about his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and how they needed to repent of their sins. And we read these verses in Acts 2.40. It says this, With many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And it's at verse 42 says, they, kind of the, the first church members, so to speak, if you will, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread, which would have most certainly included communion, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Verse 44, love this. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And, love this part, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Don't you just love that? I literally get the goosebumps thinking about day one of the church and how God established this, this, this movement known as Christianity in, in, in the church. And in the early church, they knew that they were better together. It says that they were, in fact, three times in this passage, it, it uses the word together to show that they had this common unity, this, this community with each other. Verse 44, it says that, the, that all the believers were together. Verse 46, it says, every day they did what? They continued to meet together. Where? In the temple court, so kind of in a large group gathering. And they broke bread in their homes, in a small group gathering, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. From day one, that's the way that it was. Love that, right? In fact, this, this, was, this was something that continued on long after day one. It continued on long after day one uh, in, in Acts 5.42. It, it says this, every day they continued, whoops, Acts 5.42, I think I've got it here, says day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they, uh, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And, and here, here's my point. You know, again, we've been talking about small groups and, and as we refer to them as community groups here. And here, here's one of my big points is this, is that small groups is not some new church program. It's not. It's not this, this new fancy idea. It's not something that just large churches do. It's not just something that small churches do. It's not just something that you see in the American church. You know, this is something that, that from day one, they met together. They got together from house to house, and they were together as this community. From the very onset of the church, followers of Jesus have, have been meeting together together in these small groups. And it's not this add-on either. It's not just like, well, here's a bonus church gathering. In fact, I believe that it's just as important as our Sunday morning gathering to, to, to gather together 
in circles in, 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 in a small group. In fact, I, this is hard for me to say. In fact, if you had to choose between being here on a Sunday morning and being in a small group, I would say choose a small group. And maybe you're thinking, well, how in the world can you, how in the world can you say that? Listen, we can get content from lots of different sources. And, you know, we gather together, and I know that, that you're getting more than content when you're here on a Sunday morning, okay? But you could, you could watch online, and we're so glad for, for those of you that do watch online, but you still need to be in a community. You still need to be surrounded by other people that will encourage you to actually apply what the truth of God's Word says, right? That's what we talk about when we, when we say, you know, in our small groups, we apply the Bible to life, we build authentic relationships, and we care for each other. It's the ABCs. You know, so I, I really do believe that, that you need to be connected with other followers of Jesus that will encourage you in your faith. I've never met anybody that's really been growing in their faith that, that has done it all alone. They've always been able to point back to somebody else that encouraged them in their walk with Christ. And so I really believe that, again, from, from this text, it tells us that we need to meet together corporately, but then also we need to meet together, uh, you know, outside of, of, of this room and outside of this type of a setting. You know, we're the church gathered here on Sundays, but we're also the church that's scattered throughout the week. So for, from the very onset of the church 2,000 years ago, the body of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ, recognized that we are better together. And it couldn't be more clear. I love Acts chapter 2. I almost said this at the beginning, but you probably wouldn't believe me. Acts chapter 2 is probably my favorite passage of Scripture. Because I have so many favorites, but this is, man, I get fired up when I think about this. And it describes in great detail this church culture that, that they were creating and what it was like and how those early Christ followers, how they interacted with each other, they cared for each other's needs to the point that if somebody had a need, they went and sold property to meet their need. I mean, that's devotion. That's being devoted to one another like we talked about here last week. They were committed to each other and caring for each other. And so we, we see from Acts 2 how they interact with each other. We see some of the activity in the church. We see some of the, those important details of the, the fundamental church practices right from the very beginning. Again, the, one of those uh, being baptism. On day one, 3,000 people were baptized. It's amazing to think about. And today, we're not baptizing 3,000 people, but we are baptizing two believers. And I'm so excited about that. It's so incredible because it's just as thrilling today as it was 2,000 years ago because these baptisms that you're going to see today, they symbolize lives that have been changed by Christ. And that is something that we should all get excited about, a life that has been changed by Christ. Now, before we do these two baptisms, I, I just want to explain what baptism is. And maybe you're not quite familiar you know, with, with what baptism is, and it, but, but it really is symbolizing this brand new life in Christ uh, and, and that we get to celebrate uh, that reality of this new life in Christ through this ancient practice known as baptism. But have you ever thought, like, why do we baptize people? I mean, you ever thought, like, why do we every once in a while fill up, you know, a tub and put people underneath the water? I mean, just, just from, the out, from, from an outside perspective, you're like, well, that just seems a little bit weird. Is that, is that am I the only one that, that, that sometimes thinks, well, that's, why do we do that? You know, maybe I'm the only one, but so for the next couple of minutes, I just want to share why we do baptism and why we do baptism the way that we do it here, um, and then after that, we're going to celebrate communion together. So lucky for you, you get two sermons today, uh, so awesome. Nobody seemed like they were lucky. Everybody's like, man, I'm going to miss the Bills game. That's all I know, right? Um, go Bills. Um, if but listen, if you've been coming to Obi for any length of time, you know that our mission is to honor God by making more and better followers of Jesus. That's what we're all about. And that mission has been given to us by Jesus. Uh, in fact, not long after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus appeared to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. Um, and, and then, so you read these words in Matthew 28. So these words are some of Jesus' last words, kind of his marching orders for us. In Matthew 28, it's known as the Great Commission. You don't need to know that necessarily. There's not going to be a test afterwards, but that's what it's called. It's the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Jesus says in verse 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make 
disciples of all nations. Go make disciples. Go make more disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and what else? Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So I want you to just not, don't just make more disciples. I want, I want them to get better and better, right? I want them to, to make some spiritual strides in their relationship with Christ. So I want you to teach them everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus said, this is what I want you to do. This is your mission. Go make more disciples, go make better disciples, right? And so Jesus said that. So why do we baptize people? Well, because Jesus told us to. He told us to, as simple as that. And 2,000 years later, we're still doing that. But what is baptism? Maybe you're thinking about what is baptism? Well, let me first of all tell you what baptism's not, what it's not. Baptism isn't a means or a part of your salvation. It's not a means to your salvation. You see, if, if baptism was the way that we entered into a relationship with Jesus, if baptism was how we got saved, so to speak, that would mean that salvation can be achieved by us by doing something, that, that we are the active participants. We're the one that, that is doing the work of salvation because we are getting baptized, but that's not the way that it is. Because that would be works. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us this. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from your, yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. So we can't go to God and say, Hey, I've been baptized, so I'm in, right? Because I did this. That's not the way that it works. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's not by works, so, so that no one can boast. Besides that, maybe recall when Jesus was dying on the cross in Luke chapter 23, and there were, there were two, other, two other men that on crosses that day. There were two criminals, uh, most likely murderers, that were, that were on the sides of him. And one of them looked over at Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked back at that criminal on the cross, and he said, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, notice some things that didn't happen to that criminal on the cross. Jesus didn't say, I would love to get you into heaven, but first of all, you got to get down and go get baptized. Didn't say it, right? Nor did he say this other popular, popular myth. He says, well, you just got to be a good person. He didn't tell him that. He didn't say, you know, as soon as you get all your good deeds together and we'll kind of weigh them up against your bad deeds, we'll see if you can get in. So if you can just go do some more good deeds to erase, you know, some of those bad deeds, he didn't say that. In fact, we say this all the time at our church. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. It's when we ask Jesus to be the forgiver of our sin and the leader of our lives, and when we begin to follow him, that's what brings us into a relationship with him. It's not because we've just been a good person. Should we be a good person? Absolutely. But it's not our good works that gets us into a relationship with Jesus. So the criminal on the cross, he didn't have the opportunity to get baptized or go do a bunch of good deeds. Instead, he was saved by the grace of God, not by his works, just like Scripture tells us. So if baptism isn't a part of our salvation, then what is baptism? Let me give you three things. If you're taking notes, you might want to write these down. Uh, the first one is this. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward decision. It's an outward expression of an inward decision. When someone becomes a follower of Christ, that's an internal decision. Well, baptism is that outward expression of that inward decision. It's letting others know of this changed life. The second thing is this. Baptism is identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Romans 6.4 says it this way. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, uh, through, the, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So we're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's saying So baptism is saying, I believe in this. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that's what I'm trusting in for this new life. In fact, one of the other things that, that we, we say around here is anytime somebody can predict their own death, burial, and resurrection and pull it off, that's the one you want to follow, right? They deserve more than just a couple of holidays like Christmas and Easter, that's the one that you want to trust in. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So when somebody gets baptized, we're saying, I believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And I'm trusting in that reality for my salvation. Besides that, 
Just the, the fact of baptism, even, even, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. When we baptize somebody, we put them under the water. And it's symbolizing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So even the, the method of baptism points to that reality. The third thing is this, that baptism is going public with your faith in Jesus and his teaching. Baptism is going public with your faith in Jesus and in, in his teaching. It's, it's this public allegiance to Jesus. It's just like when you got married, right? When you got married, you know, you gathered a bunch of your friends and family together. Uh, and I did many of your weddings. I was just looking out last night at, at uh, we did our, our fall bonfire inside. Nothing was burned, by the way. Um, and I was just looking at all the people that I had done their weddings. And it's just pretty cool. But listen, when you got married, you made a public declaration that you love this person. In fact, you said, most likely, hopefully, you said, you know, for better, for worse, for richer and poor, and sickness and, and health, to love and to cherish, until death do us part, right? And you made a public declaration that you love this person and you were committed to this person for the rest of your life. When we get baptized, we're making this public declaration saying, I love Jesus and I'm committed to him for the rest of my life. So it's this, this public declaration and it's going public with your faith in Christ. So Why? Why do we immerse people? Why do we put them under the water? Maybe that's a question you've, you've wondered, and certainly there are, there are multiple different views as to, as to uh, you know, how to baptize somebody, and many of you, you grew up in a, in a religious tradition um, that, that, that did either sprinkling or pouring or, or even infant baptisms, and, and, and I'm not trying to bash your upbringing, but let me explain to you and present to you a case why we practice baptism by immersion. Well, and, it, and it's really as simple as that's what the word means. <laughs> it really is. See, the word for baptism, actually, if you study it, 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 it clarifies some of those misunderstandings that, that people have. See, the, the original word had no religious connotation. In, in, in its original context, to, to baptize, it, it had no religious connotation. For us, it only has a religious connotation. We, when we say baptism, we automatically think something that happens at a church service. But for them, in their first century culture, it was just a normal, everyday, common word. Baptize. Baptizo means to, to dunk, to dip, to plunge, or to submerge. That's what it means. And so they knew that from the outset, that that's what that means. In fact, we've shared this before. I know some of this is old information for many of you, um, but... You know, that word was used like if a ship had sunk in battle, it was baptized. It had submerged, right? Uh, if you wanted to change the color of a shirt from white to red, you would baptize it, you know? You would take it and you'd put it in, in red dye and you'd baptize it. And you didn't call all your friends. Like, hey, we're going to do some baptisms today. Would well, you want to come over, bring whatever shirt you want, and we're just going to baptize them, right? It was just a normal word for them. And it meant to dip, to dunk. It was also used if, if somebody had drowned. They'd be like, well, did you hear about those two kids that got baptized the other day? That's too bad. You know, so we're going to drown a couple kids today. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. We're not drowning anybody. <clears throat> but we are going to dunk them. We're going to submerge them. In fact, it was such a common word that Josephus, who was a first century Jewish scholar, said that it was a part of a pickle recipe, right? And you're like, What? Yeah, they baptized cucumbers. Yeah, they dunked them, they submerged them, and they kept them immersed. So we're going to do that today. Justin said I could hold her under for two minutes. I don't know. Dan, you got to, what's, what's the time? And don't answer that. <coughs> don't answer that. <coughs> you know, so, so my, my point is, that's what the word means, to baptize, to means to, to immerse. So that's why we practice immersion here, because, you know, when the Bible is clear on something, that's the way we want to do it. So we, we just want to do what, what Scripture tells us. And again, it is this picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In a few minutes, up in the baptistry, um, I'm going to ask these two young ladies two, two questions uh, that you, you probably won't be able to hear me or, or hear them because hopefully I will remember to take my microphone off before I get in there. Uh, but the two questions I'm going to ask them are simply this. First of all, have you asked Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life? Have you asked Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life, the, your Lord and Savior? Have you asked Jesus to do that? By the way, if you haven't done that, you can do that today. 
you can ask Jesus to come into your life, to, to, to wash you, to, to take away your sin, to make you a new person from the inside and out. And if you have questions about what that means, you know, by all means, talk to me after the service. I would love to, to point you in the right direction. If you're watching online, you can send us a message. Uh, you can write something on your connection card. We'd love to explain to you what it means to have this relationship with Jesus, to ask Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life. So the second question I'm going to ask is, will you, by God's grace, follow him the rest of your life? Will you, by God's grace, follow him the rest of your life? And if I think they're lying, we're just going to hold them under. And, uh, and their life will be very, very short. It's like, for the, next, <clears throat> for the next two minutes, will you, by his grace? And anyway, it's not going to be the way it goes. So a question for you is, for you, have, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized by immersion since trusting in Christ as your Savior? And, it, and if you haven't yet, you know, perhaps this will inspire you. It doesn't matter what your age is. Uh, but perhaps this will inspire you to take that step of obedience. And again, if you have questions you want to talk about it, you know, write something on your connection card, grab me after the service, send us a message, and, and we would love to, to have a follow-up conversation with you. So that's really, in a nutshell, what baptism is all about. Uh, about. It's why we celebrate, and every time somebody gets baptized, we're reminded of the mission that God has called us to, um, to make more and better followers of Jesus. Uh, and when somebody gets baptized, it, for me, I, I just see the church fulfilling that mission uh, of being obedient to the things that God has called us to. So Kara and Bridget, if you guys want to come forward uh, at this time, in a moment you're going to hear both of their stories of, of life change. Um, and while we're transitioning to that, you're also going to hear a couple more stories of life change uh, from Carrie and Mike. Uh, they're going to share some of their stories of, of what has happened in their lives since being a part of a small group. About three years ago, or three years ago, my father passed away. And we've had some family issues through that. Some hurtful things have been done, said. And this men's group has been one of the best things I've ever joined. They've helped me out tremendously through this, through this issue. And I have talked to them about it at a couple different meetings and we prayed over it and they've given me suggestions and they've just helped me out as like a brother would and the week of our barbecue here at the church the community barbecue we had a family meeting scheduled for that day I did not want to go I was not going to go and Toward the end of the barbecue, three or four of the guys said, hey, come here, I want to talk to you. They pulled me aside, and they prayed with me. They prayed me up. They, they prayed and, and gave me encouragement and convinced me that it was something that I should do. I should go. I should let God take it over, and, 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 and they gave me some suggestions. And one of the suggestions was, before you get there, stop and pray, and then go to your meeting. Um, and just do what you have to do. I went. Yeah, I did stop and pray before I got there. Once we were there, it went fairly well. Had a couple of he real heated moments. There would have been a time when that wouldn't have come out like it did. I thought about what the guys said. I. God helped me through it, and he did, and what the men's group did for me was just like almost great. I mean, it was just awesome. We left the meeting shortly after that, and, and it, it's been, I was real glad I went. I mean, I, I really needed to be there, but I, if it hadn't been for this men's group, I wouldn't have went. There's no way I'd have went. This men's group just does so much for, for members and other people, members of the community. Um, it's 
really a good thing. Having served in the military for 27 years, I learned early on what brotherhood, sisterhood, what it really means. I served during peacetime and wartime. Um, when I retired in 2005, since 2005 till now actually, I've been searching, something's been lacking in my life. I've missed that camaraderie and that brotherhood uh, since coming here to Obai, being invited into this brotherhood, I have felt a connection that I've been lacking in my life. My wife pointed out, go to that, go attend, see what it's like. My first meeting, I felt that connection and I have felt it ever since. We've prayed, we've wrapped arms around each other, we've talked, we've connected. It's that brotherhood feeling that you just don't get just anywhere. I, I had it in the military and I, I lost it. I longed for it and now it's back. I feel strongly about it. I feel that connection and now I'm back to being a, a warrior. This time though, it's different. Now I'm God's warrior and it, it's a feeling. It's, it, you just can't explain it, but you know it deep inside. It's special, it's very special. Good morning. My name is, is Kara Brown and I am 35 years old today. I was born and raised in Olean, New York, but I currently reside in Allegheny, New York with my husband, Daniel, and my three-year-old son, Xander. I work as a medical assistant for General Physicians, PC. I really enjoy spending time with my family, worshiping, and fellowship here at Obi Community Church. I was raised in a Catholic home. I went to church and religion every Sunday. I served as an altar girl and I helped out in the church. I always believed in God, but never fully understood what it meant to follow Jesus. I knew some scripture, but was never taught to actually read the Bible. I listened to the priest, but didn't grasp what he was saying. I always felt as if we were just going through the motions, but that was a normal Christian lifestyle. After high school and college, when I was out on my own, I drifted away from going to church. I felt like I never got anything out of it, so what was the point? I was living a pretty reckless life. Then some pretty traumatic events took place, and it was a huge eye-opener for me. I didn't want to be that person or live that life, so something had to change. I decided to go back to church. It was a non-denominational church, and it was very different from what I was used to, but in a good way. I actually understood what the pastor was saying, and it all made sense. I knew that this is where I was supposed to be and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Living for Jesus has changed my life in so many ways. He brought me to my wonderful husband and his amazing family. He blessed me with a beautiful son and also to Pastor Dave and this awesome church family. I am eternally grateful and I am so excited for this next step of baptism.
My name is Bridget Bennett, and I'm 30 years old. I live in Portageville, New York with my husband, Justin. I'm a teacher at Perry Central School. I enjoy reading books, quilting, camping with my husband, going to car shows, snowmobiling, spending time at home, and spending time with my family. Before knowing Jesus, I knew God was real, but I thought I only needed him when things were bad and to pray for a miracle, usually for a healing of a family member who was sick. I tried, to <clears throat> I tried to be a good person and always tried to do the right thing, but I never felt good enough in that I was a failure. I tried to fit in with a popular crowd, but it never felt right. It always seemed like no matter how good I was or how many right choices I made, I would never be fully accepted and appreciated by my family and friends because it was never as good as what someone else around me was doing. As I got older, that feeling grew that I would never be good enough to meet anyone's expectations of me as a wife, a daughter, sister, aunt, teacher, and overall a person. The negative self-image infiltrated everything I did, leaving me living a life where I didn't know who I was or who would accept someone like me and feeling negative and down about myself most of the time. I felt I had to put on a good person mask to be around other people. I kept asking myself why it seemed like no one would love me as I am. There was always a need for acceptance in my life that I wasn't getting from only being a good person. When I first started going to church, I was curious to know more and tried to understand, while also trying to fit into some type of group, but something still didn't feel right. I thought that I would gain a need for acceptance by joining a church family, which didn't happen until years later. When I first said the sinner's prayer and accepted Jesus, I didn't understand what I was saying, but knew it was the right thing to do to fit in. It wasn't until years later that I truly understood what it means to accept Jesus. My previous pastors, Jeff and Hannah, were a huge influence in my life turning to Jesus before they had to move back to Canada. They taught me how to truly worship and how to understand the Bible. They introduced me to who Jesus truly is, my friend, my guide, my savior, my protector, and the only one who deeply and truly understands me. When I was finally shown and fully realized that Jesus could be more of the person he, that, that I... Sorry. <laughs> I felt I could be more of the person that he had meant me to be instead of the mask that I put on each time um, that a good person that I have that had never failed. I have learned that failure is a part of this life here on earth and that I shouldn't let it control me. I started trusting Jesus at my old church when Pastor Jeff and Hannah um, had a class at the church using a book study called Finding Father. If it wasn't for them coming to my church, and learning so much from them, I would still have a curiosity that would go unfulfilled. They helped me to fill in the gaps I felt about being around and being accepted by other people. I have continued in getting to know Jesus with support from my husband, Justin, my in-laws, Ed and Cindy, my sister-in-law, Bridget, and my nieces. Obi Community Church has continued to positively feed my curiosity for knowing Jesus through the sermons, worship, and small group, group class times. Christian music has also made a great impact on positively showing me the relationship I have with Jesus and showing me the deeper connection he wants to have with me. Jesus changed everything in my life. He showed me that he accepts me no matter what happens, and he's teaching me to change my thoughts about myself to be more of the way he sees me. Jesus is also teaching me that it doesn't matter what other people think of me because he already sees me as his. It's so powerful to know and understand that no matter what happens on this earth, that Jesus loves and accepts people as they are. And in that love, he teaches how to change your thoughts and be more like, and be more like his thoughts of love towards others and yourself. Jesus has taught me so much about him and how he sees me, more positive than I see myself. 
He helps me get through the negative thoughts that creep up when something goes wrong, and they still do, to hold on to his truth that is the rock I can stand on in the storms of life. I want to be baptized today because I am choosing to publicly announce my choice to follow and love Jesus, accepting him to be my savior and my leader for the rest of my life. Um, here at Obai Community Church, we love baptisms, and I'm always excited on Baptism Day. Um, it's just a chance to see God at work, and he is at work. Um, he's here right now, and the reason I know that is because Scripture says where two or three are gathered uh, in his name, he's here in their midst, and he's here. Um, if you couldn't see that, from what we just witnessed or don't feel it, it's still true. Um, he's a way maker, a miracle worker. Uh, he is touching hearts. He's changing lives. And we get to be a part of that. Um, and our response to that is worship. So I just ask you to stand and worship with us. <coughs>
Please be seated. You know, it's been a pretty exciting day so far, huh? hasn't it? Man. Woo! Is right. Yeah, so so thankful to be a part of, of this service. I'm glad that we can enjoy this special day together. And, you know, the only thing that can make this better is to celebrate communion together. And we're going to do that here in just a couple minutes. But before we, before we celebrate communion together, there's just a couple things you need to know. First of all, you don't need to be a member of our church uh, to participate with us. If you have asked Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life, and if you're living in a right relationship with him, we invite you and we encourage you to join with us. Again, if you're watching online, we encourage you to join with us too. Hopefully you have your stuff ready for that as well. The second thing is this, as a symbol of unity, you know, if you could just wait for my lead and we can all participate together. So wait as we partake of the bread and of the cup. And we'll do that all at the same time. Now today we're going to continue to celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. And, and again, remember, Jesus didn't ever tell us to celebrate his birth, but he gave us two things, two reminders about his death, burial, and resurrection through communion and baptism. And today, as we celebrate communion, I, I want you to imagine being there on day one. Imagine being there in the crowd and, and, and all of a sudden, this amazing thing is hap happening. Uh, you're, you're seeing the, these, these apostles and these disciples that are performing these, these miracles. And, and I want you to imagine that, that, that right from the very beginning, that you're there on day one of the church. Imagine that you had just heard about the sacrifice of Jesus as Peter preached that first message. Imagine the conviction that was on your heart, knowing that it was because of our sin, because of your sin, that Jesus was crucified for you. Imagine that that conviction in your heart led you to not only to trust and to follow Jesus, but also led you to follow him in the believer's baptism. Imagine being baptized, perhaps, by one of the apostles themselves. Imagine being a part of that. Imagine being a part of this new movement of believers uh, 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 believers in Jesus who would eventually be called Christians. Imagine being that. And then imagine meeting together in the temple courts and from house to house with these early followers of Jesus, these new brothers and sisters in Christ. Imagine that excitement that they must have had to be a part of that. And we get to share in that same excitement because we've experienced baptism together where we're going to experience communion together. We get to, to gather together on a Sunday morning. As a church gathered, we get to gather outside of this building for, for uh, the, the church scattered in, in small groups. We still get to do all of these things. And even in this moment, we get to celebrate communion together. And we remember his sacrifice for us, his sacrifice for our sins. And so as we begin, I want us just to examine our own relationships with Jesus. In fact, Scripture tells us this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. He says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're proclaiming the sacrifice of Jesus, and we're expecting and longing for the return of Christ. Then verse 27 in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. So we want to just take a moment for some silent prayer. Examine your life to, to, to confess any known sin, to forsake any known sin and repent from that. So let's go ahead and do that right now. You know, as we think about the bread, you know, we think about that sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We're reminded of the fact, the reality that Jesus' body was nailed to a cross for us. In fact, when Peter preached that first message, he talked about it. In that first message in Acts 2, he addressed the crowd of people and he reminded them that Jesus was crucified 
for our sins. In Acts 2.36, Peter said, Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Messiah. See, Jesus is the promised Messiah. He's the Lord of the universe. And he deserves to be the leader of our lives. See, he didn't deserve to die. He was the sinless son of God. He was innocent. He was perfect in every way. But, but like all of those animals that were sacrificed in the Old Testament leading up to Jesus, they, they were sacrificed for, for the sins of other people. And our sin was passed on to Jesus on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross. Why? So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful, so eternally grateful for the body of Christ that was broken for us that hung on the cross for us to pay the penalty for our sins. So God, we thank you for your body and how it just was tortured and mutilated and abused for me, for my friends here, for those early followers of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And so God, we, we thank you for the sacrifice that you've made for us, for our sins. We thank you for the body of Christ. Amen. So 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we consider the cup, we're reminded of the blood of Christ and how Jesus spilled his blood on the cross for us. Like the old song says, what can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Again, in Acts 2, when Peter preached this message of repentance to the crowd at Pentecost, He said this to the people about Jesus in Acts 2, 23. He said, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. See, those nails that, that pierced our Savior's hands and feet caused the blood to flow from his body. In Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In fact, that's why Jesus had to be born in the first place. That's why we celebrate Christmas, is because the Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. He took on flesh and blood. And the reason why He took on flesh and blood is so that He could could have His flesh mutilated, and so He could have His blood flow for us. It's the reason why he had to celebrate, or why he had to take on flesh and blood. In 1 Peter 3, we read this. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for who? For the unrighteous. That's you and I, friends. Why? To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Let's give thanks for the blood of Christ at this time. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice and how you shed your blood for us. That your blood was poured out on the cross for us, for me. So God, I I thank you for your sacrifice, for your willingness to drink that bitter cup, your willingness to go to the cross to have your blood shed for me. So God, we, we give you praise. We give you glory for what you've done in our lives. And we thank you again for the blood of Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11.25 says this, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
Now remember once again, Jesus never told us to celebrate his birth, but he gave us these two things to remind us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Communion and baptism. And we, here we are 2,000 years later, eternally grateful for what Jesus has done. So thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus, but remind, just to, to remind you that if there is no resurrection, we have nothing to celebrate. We have nothing to celebrate if there's no resurrection because Jesus wouldn't have been who he claimed to be. But we know that Jesus rose again. Peter, who was one of those eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, he said this in the first sermon 2,000 years ago in Acts 2.24. He said, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And it's because of that reality that we gather on a Sunday, because he rose again on a Sunday. We gather on a Sunday to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through baptism and communion and through our worship of our risen Savior and our soon coming King. So let's continue on in that celebration. Please stand and join us as we sing.
Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you, Lord, that you chose to give up a perfect existence with God the Father, to be made flesh, to become down, to dwell among us, Lord. We thank you for the example you sent, the life you've lived without sin, and we thank you most of all for your death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you that that gave us life, Lord. We pray for those who have followed you in the waters of baptism today. We pray that you would put your hand upon them, Lord. Bless them. And I pray that you would be with this church, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to be blessed. And I pray that you would help us to gather again the next time the doors are open. In your name I pray. Amen.